Great. Well, welcome, guys. So if we look at risk-based auditing, so we're going to focus on that and, and using that approach for effective compliance strategies. Now, we've had a lot of risk-based focus pulling out from quality by design and a lot of things that the FDA has, has been putting out there for us for the last 10 years or so, a lot of this being pulled from manufacturing, of course. But we had the final guidance on risk-based monitoring that came out in 2013, August of 2013, as a matter of fact, and provided us some insight into the risk-based approach application from a clinical perspective. Now, we had relied historically on ICHQ9, which is, again, from a manufacturing standpoint, but then the EMA put out their reflection paper in November of 2013 about quality risk management and clinical research. So I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that document. Are you? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> so we use that, again, as... as um, a touchstone, really, for how we apply these things. I would argue that the risk-based monitoring, those sort of things, might have been a bit novel for some t traditional monitoring approaches, but it's what we've been primarily doing in, in auditing for years. Interestingly enough, in my experience, that even though everyone was kind of all abuzz with the risk-based approach, I'm now seeing in audits late last year and more certainly this year as well that people are kind of drifting back to the 100% source document verification. So they're going back to what we have has been established to not be effective, but they're not really quite sure how to turn that corner and use that risk-based approach. As I have often said to folks, you know, that risk-based approach, particularly for monitoring and those sort of things, is like building a unicorn. Everyone has an idea of what it should look like, but no one's actually seen it in action. So we're going to talk about how we take these things and apply them to our auditing processes. Being mindful that, as Ray was saying too, looking at doing our site inspections and, and going and doing those audits, when we go out, we are also auditing the monitoring process because we're going to be looking at those systems. So within this course, we're going to talk about the structure of the quality assurance and quality control relationship, where they overlap and where they diverge. We'll look at similarities and differences in risk-based auditing and risk-based monitoring within the context of the QA, the QC. We're going to look at elements of risk-based auditing compared to traditional auditing practices. What are we maybe not capturing that we should when we go out and do these audits? We're going to do a risk assessment and management principles and apply those to clinical quality assurance. So how do we take the information that we have already available to us and use it in a way that really reflects back our true regulatory risk? We'll look at the timing of, audit, of audits and how that impacts the risk assessment and the capability for controlling that risk. And we're going to look at some recent noncompliance trends and, of course, regulatory focus from the FDA's perspective, but be mindful that these findings unfortunately translate throughout other regulatory bodies as well, MHRA, EMA, Health Canada, PMDA as well are finding some of the same issues. And we have to ask ourselves if we are in a position to be overseeing these processes and these issues keep evolving, maybe we need to take a closer look as to what we are reviewing when we're out there. So as we know, good clinical practice is really why we do what we do, why we're all involved in this. We want to make sure that we're getting credible, credible data from protected subjects and that supports our applications that go out and then ultimately put a new product out there for the general public. We have to make sure that we meet these obligations, but starting out we have to know what the expectations are before we start moving in this arena. So an audit, of course, is a systematic and independent examination of trial-related activities and documents. If you look at ICH's definition, it really puts audit in a retrospective position. And this is something that the FDA has been cited for by the Office of Inspector General, is being more concerned with data integrity and less concerned with subject safety because they're going in after the fact. So we saw a few years ago the FDA trying to address this by doing more real-time inspections, going out um, in real-time, in process, and they have found that it's a bit cumbersome for them in terms of their resources and how they're able to use those. But even though this is posited as being a retrospective approach, we, we want to make sure, and we'll talk about bringing it into the forefront, we want to make sure that we appreciate the difference between looking at data and looking at systems that generate that data. When we are out doing an audit, we are looking at systems that should support everything that needs to be in play to get us that credible data from protected subjects. We need to do so in an independent fashion. Oftentimes we will find folks that it's good job security if you're a CRA and then you turn around 
can go back and audit your site, but it certainly doesn't put you in a position of being independent from operations. So we want to make sure that we, we appreciate that we're going to look at documents, of course, but we also need to look at the activities. And oftentimes uh, our best way to assess those activities is to either witness them or certainly talk with the people who are performing those activities. 